Welcome to the Good News Only radio show. My name is Tanya McIntyre, and I am passionate about positive media. You know, I believe we need to be exposed to all the good things and all the good people in the world to help offset all that negative stuff that we are bombarded with every day from mainstream media trying to convince us that our world is full of thieves and murderers and terrorists. You know, I can tell you that after spending 22 years in mainstream media as a broadcast journalist, that there are far more good things happening in the world than bad, and far more good people in the world than bad. And as always, I have one of those good people joining us for this edition of the Good News Only radio show. How about this for a life motto? Live simple and you will live free. I love that. And that is the life motto of Rob Greenfield. Rob is an adventurer, an environmental activist, and a humanitarian, among other things. Rob is the creator of the food waste fiasco that you have no doubt heard about. It's a campaign that strives to end food waste and hunger in the U.S. and hopefully globally. Rob, welcome to the Good News Only. So great to have you here. Thanks for having me on. It's, uh, we definitely feel the same about the world being much more full of good people than bad people. And the mainstream media has a skew on, on what they're showing there. Absolutely. You know, I always say the agenda of mainstream media uh, is to perpetuate what I call the FUD factor, fear, uncertainty, and doubt, because I, I know that to be true. I'm embarrassed to say I was part of that agenda for 22 years. So now my life passion is to offset all that negativity with truth. Uh, you know, the truth is there are far more good things and good people going on in the world than bad. And, you know, you have proven it yourself with your travels, Rob. I mean, you're on a mission yourself. Yeah, it sounds like we're, uh, we have a pretty similar mission there. Excellent. Rob, I read on your website that you are a dumpster diver. I can't imagine you diving into a dumpster, but please tell us why you do that. Well, so in the United States, we... We throw away $165 billion worth of food per year. Now, that's billion, not million, with a B. That's more, to put that into perspective, because it's a big number, that's more than the, the budgets for all of America's national parks, all of the public libraries, veterans' health care, the federal prisons, the FBI, and the FDA combined. So wow. it's a huge number, a huge amount of food. It's staggering. A lot yeah. of people... It's, it's hard to comprehend. Now, a lot of people think that that is half-eaten plates of spaghetti or apple cores or things like that. But we're talking about perfectly good, untouched, immaculate food. A lot of this food, you know, a portion of that food is being thrown away by grocery stores. So grocery store dumpsters, I've discovered across the nation, are filled to the brim with perfectly good food. And so the whole idea of dumpster diving is not to meet my needs, Although I do, that's where I get a lot of my food, but it's to draw attention to how much food is going to waste and inspire and influence change so that instead of throwing away food, we're feeding people in need. Yeah, no kidding. Um, Rob, you've cycled across the U.S. twice, and you, you've done that on, a, I understand, a bamboo bicycle. I, I've never heard of a bamboo bicycle before then. But your your whole objective here is to bring your sustainability message to not only Americans, but the world. And in fact, you've written a book. I love the name of this book, Dude, Making a Difference. So you obviously think that one person can indeed make a difference in the world. And I'm curious to know why do you think more people don't take those bold actions to make a difference? Well... You, you use the key word there, bold. I mean, you have to, you, it, so the way things are designed today in the United States, they're really designed to have people moving along in the same general stream of life and to be doing generally the same thing. And a lot of people just feel very insecure to be different. To be different in the United States is often the thing that people try to avoid the most. I know when I was growing up as a kid, all I tried to do is be normal. Well, maybe I'll, I had my little, dip, be a little bit different, but in general, fit in and be normal. And so to really make a big difference in the world, you got to do something different. And you got to, you got to, to make change, you have to do something different. And so it is a nerve wracking thing if you're living in a society that basically tries to make everybody the same. 
um, then it's it's a struggle. It's a daily struggle to go against that grain and to try to be different and to try to change things. Well, you had a fairly good childhood from what I've been able to learn about you on the Internet, and I know not everything we read on the Internet is true, but I do understand that you were pretty outdoorsy at a young age. You were in the Boy Scouts. You, in fact, became an Eagle Scout, and you even pursued a science degree. You went on to university. Uh, you, You were on the road to great success. You started a marketing company in San Diego. And you actually had a goal at one time to be a millionaire by the time you were 30. So I'm curious to know what happened in your life to inspire you to take such an abrupt change. Well, I'm 30 right now, and I have $600. So you're <laughs> right. It was, I am definitely not. I have make, made a, an abrupt change. Um, well, basically what, what happened was a lot of what you described, I mean, the millionaire part really was uh, that was me working within the system, thinking that you needed money to have freedom and money to have an impact and to you know live a unique, great life. Money, money was the center of everything. That's what I thought. I actually grew up very low income. It was my mom and my three brothers and sisters living in a two bedroom house. She made like fifteen thousand dollars a year to support all of us. Um, so because of that, I had a desire to have money because I saw a lot of other people with money and I wanted to live normal, like, you know, a mom and a dad in a nice house with plastic Tupperware containers <laughs> and all that stuff. That's what I wanted. So that was my focus for a while. And then basically what happened is in 2011, I started to wake up to how much my life was causing environmental and social destruction, stuff that I was buying you know, the resources that had to be pillaged from the earth to make that, but also the people that were working in horrible con- conditions to make that crap for me to buy. And I just realized that my life, through my simple daily actions, because of the globalized society we live in, was causing serious environmental destruction, both, you know, right outside my door and on, in other countries around the world. So I just decided that that's not, that's not what I want to do with my time on, the, on earth. So because of that, I had to change my ways, which were very normal ways to a large extent, and to live a life that doesn't cause destruction means you're probably going to be living a different life from the average American. Wow, that's a, that's a huge decision, Robin. Your travels have taken you across the globe. You've traveled to about 40 countries. You've covered six continents so far, spreading your message of sustainability. And I'm curious to know, in those travels, how does North America compare in general to what you've experienced? Well, the United States has 2% of the world's population, yet uses 25% of the world's resources. So that one st- st- statistic right there is quite staggering. Mm-hmm. What that says is the United States is hogging, is taking the resources of other people around the world and in doing it in a way that actually puts other people into poverty by us being extremely affluent. So here in the United States, even poverty here is affluent, is affluent compared to a lot of other people around the world. Now we're talking financial, material possessions, things like that. Because the other aspect of it is that I have seen no correlation between happiness and material or financial wealth. So the happiest people, I've, actually, I've, I've, seen a, I've seen the opposite of that. I have seen a correlation. I've seen that usually when I meet the happiest people that are often feeling actually fulfilled, they have less money and less material possessions and live in situations where a lot of people would consider squalor here in the United States with the mindset that is here. But for them, it's closer to nature. It might be dirt floors, but they're way happier, way more connected to their love to the people they love and to their life around them. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's definitely one, you know, one of the really things that I've seen time and time again in my travels around the world and yeah. through the United States. I've noticed that too. I mean, you know, we, we North Americans are so gifted just by virtue of our birth to be born in North America in such, you know, opulent conditions, I think, compared to the way a lot of people live. And I'm curious, Rob, how you grew up, I mean, you grew up with a single mom um, in relative poverty. 
What kind of messages were shaping your thought patterns as a child? I mean, you said that you equated success with money. And I'm, were those messages coming from advertising, mainstream media in general? What messages were you getting and from where? Well, you know, that's something that I think about often and I'm unraveling, you know, going back and realizing who I am because of the surroundings growing up and who I am because of the messages that were constantly bombarded into me as a young person. So uh, I do know that TV largely had a large influence on me of, of, te of painting what is the norm. And to give you an example, something that I've been learning about um, is, you know, in the United States, and I'm sure this, this is pretty similar in Canada, when you see black people on TV, they are over disproportionately, vastly disproportionately, playing roles of ba the bad person, the person, the, you know, the person that's committed a crime or done something wrong. Like, for example, cops, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's disproportionately black people. And so me growing up in northern Wisconsin, where there were almost no black people at all, there were five flat families in the town of 8,620 people. There was just a handful of black people. My relationship, my, what I experienced was mostly what I saw on TV, which is what, they, what was, purport, uh, which was, what per, was portrayed by mainstream media, which was wrong. So I had, I had ingrained into me stereo, incorrect stereotypes of people, mm -hmm. black people being, you know, one gr group of people, all sorts of different people. And those are the types of things that I've, I'm learning that I'm dealing with at the age of 30, like having to unravel these sorts of things. And the thing is, this is stuff that's so deeply ingrained into mil tens of millions of Americans. Now, most people don't want to admit that, mm -hmm. that sort of thing, because then they fear sounding racist or they fear that they are racist. But these are the types of things that have just been pushed into our minds through people, you know, sitting behind desks choosing the way to portray things. Mm -hmm. Mainstream media messages that uh, really manipulate us to believe the opposite of what is true. And I think that's what makes me so passionate now about positive media because, you know, having taken part of that agenda of mainstream media to perpetuate that FUD factor, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Uh, that is definitely my life mission now to say to people, you know what, you need to ask yourself some pretty significant questions when you are listening to mainstream media messages and advertising in general. You need to know, you know, whether or not it's true, where, the, where are the facts coming from, uh, who's providing the facts, because, you know, we, everything that we watch, read, and hear now is controlled pretty much virtually, if not literally, by five American conglomerates. And I don't think people realize that, you know, these, these people who are just a small pool of people that contain a great deal of wealth and power are manipulating us, as you said earlier, Rob, you, you know, you felt that uh, your destiny was to uh, go to university, get a good job, and pursue that millionaire mindset because that's the way we're programmed. Absolutely. It's amazing, but it's not the type of stuff you really realize until you kind of step outside of it. And one way to step outside that is through documentaries and books. That's really what, what it was for me. That's the most, one of the beautiful things about the time we live in is here in these countries that we live in, whether you're really low income or you're really wealthy. Most people in the United States have access to documentaries and books that can step them outside of the comfort zone that they're in and really expand their knowledge and transform their lives. That is one great thing about technology. I agree with you there, Rob. Now, in 2016, you traveled to Rio, Brazil, and you did it penniless. Like, that takes... Whoa, talk about a leap of faith. So you went without a cent in your pocket, and your mission was to prove that there is goodness in humanity. And I'm very curious to know how exactly did that go for you? It went well. <laughs> I landed, yeah, I landed in um, Rio, Brazil last September, September of 2015. And I had to travel 7,000 miles through Brazil, Argentina, Bolivia, Peru, Ecuador, Colombia, and, and in Panama City, Panama, 10 weeks later. And the idea was 
well, two things. One, to show that the world is a good place. People are full of good people, exactly what we're talking about, that the mainstream media disproportionately plays the, the if it, I guess the saying is, if, if it bleeds, it leads. It's something mm-hmm. I've, I've heard from a lot of media people. It's the, it's the blood and the gore, the stuff, stuff that plays, and that makes people scared. But the reality is most people are good. This is a way for me able to, me to be able to do an, you know, a sort of extreme adventure to, to show people that people are good, um, but also to show um, that you don't need nearly as much to be happy and that uh, health and happiness comes from the people you meet, relationships, experiences. A lot of this stuff is free. You don't, you don't need to have money for that. So um, it, was a, it was a great adventure. We didn't make it all the way to Panama City after all, only to Colombia. Um, it was very challenging finding a new source of food, water, energy, uh, sorry, food and water, a place to sleep, a ride. You know, we were hitchhiking across the continent. All that stuff every day made the whole thing extremely grueling. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, but it was very enjoyable. There was another documentary, another American guy whose name escapes me at the moment, but he pretty much did the same thing, and he did his travels. He didn't um, travel to Brazil, mind you. He just wanted to travel across America to prove, again, that uh, you know there are far more good people in the world than bad. But he did it through Craigslist. Oh, yeah, Craigslist Joe was that Craigslist Joe, yeah. Yeah, I did interview him as well. It was uh, awesome, you know, it, and that documentary, if you haven't seen it, uh, yeah, you're right. It's called Craigslist Joe, I believe. And uh, I actually watched that documentary, and at first I was like, "Man, this is boring." Like <laughs> this guy, Craigslist Joe, is about a bore as boring as a guy gets. But by the end, I had cried like three times. Like it really, <laughs> he really, it was, it was. I loved it. It was a great documentary. I absolutely, I really recommend it. Excellent. Now, you, you are making your own way in this world through documentaries as well. You have um, not only your book, like um, your book outlined your experience, Dude Making a Difference. That was your experience to Brazil? Am I, am I getting that right? No. No. Um, Dude Making a Difference was about my first bike ride across the United States. Okay. Obviously, I haven't read the and, book. I apologize. Oh, no worries. And then the... Um, the TV show on Discovery Channel is the the trip through South America. That's a six series Discovery Channel special, isn't it? Yep. So it didn't play in the in Canada or the United States, though. You're uh, kidding. It was for Discovery Networks International, so it played in almost every country, but not here. Wow. So uh, I'm working on some things right now, and hopefully, we'll have a positive show for people here in the United States and Canada within the next year or so. Yeah, excellent. That would be awesome to see. And I loved reading, Rob, that you donate 100% of your media income to grassroots nonprofit groups. Why do you do that? Well, um, basically, I think that they could use the money a lot better than I could. They can make the world a lot a better place than I could using that money to, you know, on frivolous things like, rent or well, not not rent not that rent is frivolous but basically i found that the more simple i live the less money i need which means i can give that money to people that are actually going to really use it to help people and help the planet so um you know i've i live you know such a simple life that i only like five thousand dollars a year is the cap that i currently have on what i can earn um, and everything else goes into nonprofit work. And so my TV show, my book, all of that goes directly to nonprofits. The other part of it is that I don't want to get, I don't like, I don't want to get wealthy from making the world a better place because one, that just doesn't seem right to me. Um, and that's really what I want to do is make the world a better place. So I don't think I should make money off of that. But two, um, money changes people's motivation and their motives all too often like people do things for the right reason but then money gets involved and then you you know a couple of years later they're not really doing it for what they were doing it for anymore and now it's more about money so it's a safeguard also to make sure that i stick to my beliefs and stick to the path that i feel is right and not get you know swayed by desires for money and stuff 
Interesting that you see, you know, I mean, you're 30. That's a pretty young age to have some some pretty significant core values. Uh, what role did your mom play in all of this, Rob? Um, well, my mom taught me a lot of, my mom taught me to care about the earth as a kid. Um, and she is an environmentalist for sure. And I didn't, you know, I didn't realize a lot of the things until I was older that she really instilled into me, but she really instilled some of the basics in life. Don't waste things. It doesn't make any sense to waste things, whether it's food or water or electricity. You know, she taught me to used to be conscious of my usage of things. Partly that was money because we didn't have a whole lot of it, but it was also just don't waste resources. Use only what you need. Um, so she, I think she deeply instilled that into me. Also, you know, I grew up in an environment where my mom is a nice person. She's nice to other people. Yeah, you know, she yelled at us as kids. <laughs> but in general, she was nice to people and didn't really do mean things to other people. So it, I would say we, I grew up in an environment where it just was like, you just don't do mean things to people. <laughs> you're, just good, you're just good to people. So she definitely uh, led by example and instilled some, you know, core things into me. So your siblings, do they think that you're crazy donating 100% of your media income to nonprofit organizations? What do they say about all this? Um, I think that the nice, one of the nice things about my family is everybody is very accepting of each other, whatever we're doing. A lot of us do very different things from each other, but the nice thing is, is that we're all very accepting. In, in many ways, us Greenfields, we're all a little bit crazy, but... <laughs> We all accept that about each other. And the nice thing is that none of us really give each other hard times and say, you should do this or you should do that. Instead, we just say, man, if you're happy, if you're doing what you want to be doing in life, then, you know, go for it. Excellent. You lived what uh, you dubbed yourself the teeny greeny lifestyle. So you were living off the grid. You lived in this teeny weeny uh, 50 square foot home. I can't believe that, like 50 square feet. That is pretty teeny weeny. Uh, but of course, you were in California, so I guess winters weren't uh, as much of a consideration for you. But, you know, I mean, you were growing your own food, collecting rainwater, uh, harnessing energy from the sun with solar panels. How long did you do that? So I lived in that tiny house for a year. Um, and yeah, so it was tiny, 50 square feet. 50 square feet, it's about as small, it's, it is the smallest, you know, house I've ever heard of in the United States or Canada. And the whole thing is, you know, I do things that are extreme for a couple of reasons. <laughs> One, it catches people, it keeps people's attention so that I can get them thinking about these important social and, and environmental issues. Because if I was doing things in a moderate manner, just conserving water and electricity and recycling and and, uh, you know, doing these things in a fairly moderate manner, well, guess what? Not many people would be noticing or listening, and there's a good chance you and I wouldn't be talking right now. Mm -hmm. I do things in an extreme way to catch people's attention, but also it's sort of a counterbalance to the extreme, what is the truly extreme Western lifestyle that exists. Now, to give you an example, the average American uses about 80 to 100 gallons of water per day. The average European uses 50 gallons per day. The average African uses two to five gallons of water per day. Wow. So the average American is using um, 20 to 50 times more water than the average African. Now, what the American lifestyle is doing is extreme. If you compare the American lifestyle to the rest of the world, it's extreme. What I'm doing is, ex is an extreme opposite of the American lifestyle to show and to point out how extreme the American lifestyle is. So through the things that I'm doing, I'm not saying live in a 50-square-foot tiny house like I did. What I'm saying is let's go somewhere to more towards the middle and actually live a life that's fair and more in moderation that will actually result in more happiness and health for everyone. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it's, it's interesting you say that because um, I follow the real estate industry, and 20, 30 years ago, the average house being built in Canada 
averaged to about 1,500, maybe 1,800, 2,200 square feet tops was the average house. And now the average house being built is 4,500 square feet. Jeez. And I'm thinking, why do people need so much room? And then with that comes a multi-billion dollar storage industry in North America. It's just mind-boggling to me. You know, I, my, I have neighbors with double garages and their two cars are parked outside because they don't have room inside their garage for their cars. There's so much crap in there. Yep. And the bigger your space is, the more likely you are to fill it up with stuff. Wow. So, Rob, you decided then to auction off your teeny tiny house. Why did you do that? Well, I was about to go traveling. I've been traveling since um, March of last year. So about almost two years, almost, sorry, almost a year. And... Um, so I knew that for about two years I wasn't going to have a home. What I'm doing right now is you know, traveling. And so I could have just sold it and kept the money for myself, but I saw an opportunity. You know, the house got a lot of attention while I was living there, and a lot of people in the United States don't have homes right now. So to me it makes sense that everybody's housed. Uh, if we're going to live in an advanced society, everybody should have basic, basic needs met. So I saw an opportunity to auction the house and raise funds to build tiny houses for people who don't have houses. And I was able to raise $10,000, which is enough to build 10 houses, was what I was hoping to do. So that's happening in San Diego right now. It takes time to get the – I'm, I'm working with – the, actually, at the same time that I was hoping to do that, a tiny house community was popping up in San Diego. So they're working on uh, getting started now, and it's sort of a transition tiny house community that gets people into the tiny houses to get them off the streets. And the idea is they'll have community gardens, rainwater harvesting, the people will have a job. One of them is growing food to sell at the local farmer's market, and it's also the solar panels. And so it's, it's also just about showing a different way of life. Um, I just thought it was a great opportunity. And you know, usually what I do is when I see an opportunity like that where I can use my resources to try to help other people, then I just I just do it. Awesome. Well, you know, Rob, I, you're definitely an inspiration to me, and I hope to our listeners as well. What's one teeny tiny thing we can do to make a difference, do you think, in our lives and perhaps ripple effect to the world? So there's so many things that we can do, and a lot of times people feel overwhelmed. Like, okay, there's so many things I'm doing wrong. What can I do? And then they result in doing nothing. Right. But the beautiful thing is that just changing one thing makes a big difference if you continue that one thing. A lifetime is a long time. So if it's just, for example, stopping the usage of single-use plastic bags and carrying a reusable bag to the store, that could mean 500. The average... I don't know what it is in Canada, but I'm sure it's similar. The average American uses about 500 plastic bags in a year. By simply carrying reusable bags, that's 500 less plastic bags. A lot go to the landfill. Uh, A lot of them can end up in nature. So that's, you know, one simple thing. Another is carrying a reusable water bottle and ditching bottled water. Mm -hmm. Save yourself a ton of money, a lot of plastic, you know, use a lot of plastic that won't be thrown away or recycled, which is a heavily resource and energy intensive process another one is riding a bike more uh, and driving less another one is eating more fruits and veggies and less animal products so not necessarily going 100 percent vegan or plant-based but just eating more fruits and veggies and less animal products that's one of the biggest things you can do so those those you know those are a couple things that, that pretty much that anyone can adapt awesome Great tips. Thank you so much, Rob Greenfield. I know you've got some downtime coming, much deserved. So keep up your great work, and we will stay connected with you at robgreenfield.tv. Thanks, Rob. Keep up the great work. Thanks so much for having me on. You keep up the good work as well. Thanks so much, Rob. Robgreenfield.tv is where you can connect with Rob Greenfield and uh, stay attuned to all his adventures. My name is Tanya McIntyre. I want to thank you so much for listening to the Good News Only radio show. And I want you to take the diet that really works, a media fast. Don't watch, read, or listen to news and see how much your life improves. I leave you with my wish for you to live well, laugh often, love always. And of course, 
I'm your perpetually positive pal, so stay positive. <laughs>